Good morning, everyone, and welcome to St. James and St. Brendan's Anglican Church for Sunday, October the 24th. As we begin our service, let us acknowledge the land that we gather on. It is the traditional territory first of the Neutral people, then of the Haudenosaunee and the Anishinaabe peoples, many of whom continue to live and work here today. This territory is covered by the Upper Canada Treaties, the Niagara Purchase Treaty, and is within the land protected by the Dish with the One Spoon Wampum Agreement. Today, this gathering place is home to many First Nations, Métis, and Inuit people. We are reminded that our great standard of living is directly related to the Indigenous people's resources and their friendship. Please stand for our opening hymn, Immortal, Invisible, God Only Wise. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all. Amen. Almighty God, to whom all hearts are open, all desires known, and from you no secrets are hidden, cleanse the thoughts of our hearts by the inspiration of your Holy Spirit, that we may perfectly love you and worthily magnify your holy name through Christ our Lord. Amen. Glory to God in the highest, and peace to his people on earth. Lord God, heavenly King, almighty God and Father, we worship you, we give you thanks, we praise you for your glory. Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, Lord God, Lamb of God, you take away the sins of the world, have mercy on us. You are seated at the right hand of the Father, receive our prayer. For you alone are the Holy One, you alone are the Lord, you alone are the Most High, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit, in the glory of God the Father. Amen. Let us pray. Lord God, our Redeemer, who heard the cry of your people and sent your servant Moses to lead them out of slavery, free us from the tyranny of sin and death, and by the leading of your spirit, bring us to our promised land. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. 
Amen. Please be seated for the first reading. The first reading is from the book of Job. Then Job answered the Lord, I know that you can do all things and that no purpose of yours can be thwarted. Who is this that hides counsel without knowledge? Therefore, I have uttered what I did not understand, things too wonderful for me, which I did not know. Hear, and I will speak. I will question you, and you declare to me. I had heard of you by the hearing of the ear, but now my eye sees you. Therefore, I despise myself and repent in dust and ashes. And the Lord restored the fortunes of Job when he prayed for his friends, and the Lord gave Job twice as much as he had before. Then there came to him all his brothers and sisters and all who had known him before, and they ate bread with him in his house. They showed him sympathy and comforted him for all the evil that the Lord had brought upon him, and each of them gave him a piece of money and a gold ring. The Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning, and he had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, and 1,000 donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. He named the first Jemima, the second Keziah, and the third Karen Hapuk. In all the land there were no women so beautiful as Job's daughters, and their father gave them an inheritance along with their brothers. After this, Job lived 140 years and saw his children and his children's children, four generations. And Job died old and full of days. The word of the Lord. We'll say Psalm 34, verses 1 through 8, responsively. <clears throat> I will bless the Lord at all times. His praise shall ever be in my mouth. I will glory in the Lord. Let the humble hear and rejoice. Proclaim with me the greatness of the Lord. Let us exalt his name together. I sought the Lord, and he answered me and delivered me out of all my terror. Look upon him and be radiant and let not your faces be ashamed. I called in my affliction, and the Lord heard me and saved me from all my troubles. The angel of the Lord encompasses those who fear him. He will deliver them. Taste and see that the Lord is good. Happy are they who trust in him. Hear us, Lord, when we cry to you. Calm our bodies and minds with the peace which passes understanding and make us radiant with the knowledge of your goodness. Through Jesus Christ, our Savior. Amen. The second reading is from the letter to the Hebrews. Furthermore, the former priests were many in number because they were prevented by death from continuing in office. But he holds his priesthood permanently because he continues forever. Consequently, he is able for all time to save those who approach God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For it was fitting that we should have such a high priest, holy, blameless, undefiled, separated from sinners, and exalted above the heavens. Unlike the other high priests, he has no need to offer sacrifices day after day, first for his own sins and then for those of the people. This he did once for all when he offered himself. For the law appoints as high priests those who are subject to weakness. But the word of the oath, which came later than the law, appoints a son who has been made perfect forever. The word of the Lord.
The Lord be with you. The Holy Gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ according to Mark. Glory to you, Lord Jesus Christ. They came to Jericho. As Jesus and his disciples and a large crowd were leaving Jericho, Bartimaeus, son of Timaeus, a blind beggar, was sitting by the roadside. When he heard that it was Jesus of Nazareth, he began to shout out, saying, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Many sternly ordered him to be quiet, but he cried out even more loudly, Son of David, have mercy on me. Jesus stood still and said, Call him here. And they called the blind man, saying to him, Take heart, get up, he is calling you. So throwing off his cloak, he sprang up and came to Jesus. Then Jesus said to him, What do you want me to do for you? The blind man said to him, my teacher, let me see again. And Jesus said to him, go, your faith has made you well. Immediately he regained his sight and followed him on the way. The Gospel of Christ. Praise Praise to you, Lord Jesus Christ. I speak to you in the name of the Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Amen. Good morning, everyone. Thank you so much for coming this morning. Um, oh, please be seated. Oh, geez. I shouldn't have to tell you that. Um, so over the uh, past few weeks recently, um, I've had a couple conversations with one or two people about the importance of church and the importance of faith, um, which kind of makes sense considering the past two years with COVID. I mean. Our building has been shut down more than it's been open over the past two years. And if you watch the news over the past two years, I mean, hundreds of thousands of people are dying because of COVID. Um, We've, you know, systemic racism has been right, right there for us to, you know, deal with and, um, you know, face the protests for vaccines, uh, protests against vaccines. Um, are the our residential schools and the indigenous children's bodies that were found, um, our, our broken medical system. There is so much hard stuff in the news. You have to wonder how can you have faith during this time? How do you have faith? <laughs> Why come to church? What's the importance of either? I want to address church first. Church is more than this beautiful building. Church is its community, it's its family. Before I even got here, there was a group of people in this church who made a point of, you know, getting the getting the, the parishioners list, and they were calling everybody during COVID to make sure that they felt connected, make sure that they knew that their family cared about them. This is our home. And unfortunately, we haven't been allowed to be in our home for a very long time, but our doors are open now and we're allowed back in our home. Church is about family and it's about having a family bigger than your immediate family. It's about knowing that you have people that you can turn to and you can count on. After Jesus died, his apostles, they would go into people's homes and they would talk and they would tell stories about Jesus and they would talk about, uh, you know, the old scriptures, the Jewish scriptures, and they would sing psalms of praise and they would talk about how, if you're going to follow Jesus, how you're supposed to live. And then they would break bread together. John read from the Old Testament and the Jewish scriptures. Leslie read and... Unfortunately, we're not singing the psalm right now, but she said the psalm of praise. And then John read from the epistles, which is how we learn how to live our lives as Christians. I just read the gospel, the story of Jesus, and then eventually we are going to break bread together. Jesus' disciples, you know, they created these communities. They had these people who never saw Jesus. 
but yet they believed. They became believers. Their faith grew. And because those communities grew, they could no longer stay in people's homes. They built these beautiful new homes. They built these big, beautiful new homes. Church is about family, and this building is our home. And it's where together we share our faith in Jesus, a faith in a person we have never seen or met before. Now some could call that absolutely asinine, absolutely crazy. I call it blind faith. Definition of blind faith is believing in something without proper understanding. It is completely having complete confidence in someone, usually God, for absolutely no reason to do so. I've spent the last 21 years working in the church, and during that time, I've had, you know, I've had people ask me, how do you believe in somebody when you have no proof? How can you believe in someone when you have no proof? I answer it one or two ways, depending on the person, and I guess basically in the mood and whether or not I really want to get into a good fight. Um, a, it's, you know, what kind of proof are you looking for? Or B, I have a whole list of proof. Do you have time to sit and chat? Now, the person, again, depending on who it is, they either, it opens up this wonderful conversation where we get to have this, you know, lovely conversation about the Lord, or they just get so annoyed with my answer, they walk away and they're just ticked off at me, which is fine. How do you have faith in someone that you cannot see? It leads us to today's gospel in Bartimaeus. Bartimaeus was literally blind. And Jesus asked him, what do you want from me? Jesus knew he was blind. What do you want from me? Well, Jesus, I, I'd like to have my sight back. Thank you. Jesus knew what Bartimaeus was going to ask. Jesus was not a stupid man. So the bigger question is, why did Jesus ask, what do you want from me? What do you want? Do you really want to see the truth? you really want your sight back? Are you going to be able to handle what you see when you get your sight back? What are you hoping to see if you get your sight back? The wonderful thing about Jesus and his questions is that, you know, these questions were 2,000 and some years ago, and they are still relevant today. What do you hope to see? What do you want from Jesus? Nobody chooses to be literally blind, but we can be figuratively blind in a multitude of ways. You know, there's the fun way of being blind, you know, blind love, you know, the beginning of a romance when everything's mushy and lovely and, you know, the person before you can do absolutely nothing wrong. Blind love. But then there's the other ones. There's the, you know, being blind by our upbringing. You know, grandma said this or grandpa said this and you know that is law. It doesn't matter what anybody else in the world says. You're unable to hear or listen to anything else. There's being blinded by our own prejudice, our own bias. Again, this has a lot to do with our own upbringing. Sometimes those bias, those prejudices are so deep inside, you don't even realize they're there. But somebody walks into a room, and for whatever reason, you just don't like them. You know? Maybe it's because that person's female, or that person's male, or that person's white, or that person's black, but there's just something. It's those deep, deep biases that keep us blinded. There's the intentional or unintentional blinders that we can have. You know, blinders that a horse wears during a race. You know, those are put on horses so they can only see in front and they don't get distracted by all the horses beside them. But we as humans can wear those same type of blinders where we just focus on the front and we don't want to pay attention to the world around us. You know, it can also be considered putting your head in the sand. And we ignore the things we see. 
We ignore the fact that, you know, there's people living on our park benches. We ignore the fact that, you know, our indigenous people have no water. Blinders on. What does it mean to be able to really see? That's the question Bartimaeus needed to answer. What did he want from God? Why did he want to see? Being able to see means you're able to observe, you're able to be a witness, you're able to have a relationship because you want to understand. You want to know what is going on around you. And faith in the Lord can help you see. Now, I'm not saying faith in the Lord is going to cure somebody's blindness. No. What I'm saying is that faith in the Lord gives us a different perspective. It allows us to see things in a different way. It allows us to be able to take a closer look at ourselves, our lives, and the world around us. However, when we have faith in the Lord, we can also have those moments where we are blinded. Even the apostles had moments when they were blinded by their own thoughts. Peter professed that Jesus was the Messiah. But then Jesus started talking about how he was going to be arrested, he was going to be beaten, he was going to be killed, and Peter rebuked him. Because, well, that's not going to happen to the Messiah. God's chosen one, that wouldn't happen. But the Messiah that Peter was thinking about was his version of the Messiah. He, he was blinded by what he believed the Messiah was going to do. The other time the apostles were blinded was when they were arguing about who was going to be great, who was going to be the greatest of them all. What they weren't listening to was Jesus saying, whoever wants to be first must be last and servant of all. They were blinded again by their perception of what the Messiah was going to do and what the Messiah was going to be. Like I said last week, they had this vision of Jesus, you know, taking over the Roman Empire. It wasn't until Jesus died and rose from the dead and ascended that that light came on and they finally saw the whole entire truth. Then they got it. They realized what Jesus was talking about. So why is faith important? How can we have faith in something we cannot see and have no real proof? Bartimaeus wanted to see again. In other words, he hadn't always been blind. He had light in his life once. Now he was sitting in darkness. Bartimaeus could not see Jesus but he could see the light that God was going to give him. And he could see how Jesus was going to change his life. Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. Faith in Jesus offers each of us clear vision of the truth. Faith in Jesus in this time, in these difficult times, helps us to see beyond our own wants and our needs. Jesus brings us from darkness into the light. Even the apostles had moments of darkness where they didn't get it. We're all human. I think I'm comfortable in saying we've all had ups and downs in our lives. I know I have, and I know there have been some dark moments where that light was so far away. But through multitude of conversations with, you know, the big guy up there, through conversations with my friends, my family, and my church family, my church family, I was able to see that light again. I was able to get strength in my faith again, and I was able to pull myself out. We don't know what caused Bartimaeus' blindness, and really it's irrelevant. Bartimaeus' faith in someone that he could not see 
allowed him to be healed. His faith in someone he could not see allowed him to cry out, Jesus, son of David, have mercy on me. And he was healed and he became a part of a much bigger community. Like so many people, we don't know what happened to Bartimaeus after he was healed. I would really like to believe that he became one of the many disciples that followed Jesus till the very end. And that he was one of the people who would go into people's homes and tell stories because he was proof. He was living proof of the great things that Jesus could do. Hopefully he was one of the ones that were breaking bread and telling stories. And that we, in theory, are descendants from one of those communities that he started. Now more than ever, I think, we need to come back to our church home. Yes, church is more than this building. But this building is our gathering place. It is our home. It is the place where we talk about the Jewish scriptures, where we sing songs of praise, where we learn how to live our lives as Christians, and we hear about Jesus, and we break bread together. Coming into this gathering space is a place where We as family and friends can come together so we can believe in something bigger and better than ourselves. It allows us to believe in someone that we have no proof in. But because of our faith, there is a light that we have and we are able to see things in a way that we have never been able to see, we've never been able to see before. Faith, church, is what gives us strength. Faith and church is what is going to get us across the finish line of everything that is happening right now. Amen.
God, the Father Almighty, Creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, the only Son of our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered from the conscious of God. He was crucified and died in his grave. He descended to death. On the third day, he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life of everlasting. Amen. <clears throat> Please be seated or kneel for the prayers of. Our prayer response this morning is hear our prayer. Faithful God, we pray for Christians throughout the world and particularly for those who are persecuted because of their faith in you. We ask for your protection for them and strength and guidance for all individuals and organizations that seek to help them. We pray for the whole family of your church, especially here in Niagara, remembering the Dunn Parish, the Reverend Canon Richard Morse, priest in charge, and the people of that parish. We pray your blessing upon our Bishop Susan, our Rector Jody. May we all be renewed in our love of the scriptures, that through the study of your word, we might encounter Jesus and allow ourselves to be transformed by his words and actions. We pray for our parish of St. James and St. Brendan. And in our parish family this week, we remember Brian and Donna Abbott, Jim and Martha Allen, Wayne and Gloria Arnold, Bob and Karen Arthur, their families and loved ones. We ask for your guidance on all that we do in our churches to ensure that we serve the local community in the way that you want us to. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Creator God, we thank you that you care for the entire world and all its people. <clears throat> and we pray for all the countries that are torn apart by conflict, illness, and hunger. We especially pray for all migrants and refugees around the world and ask that they meet kindness and generosity in their search for a new home. We pray for the leaders of all nations that they would strive for justice and peace for all people. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, we pray for our local community of Port Coburn. As we strive to develop our mission action plan, please show us how we can best serve people who are struggling in any way and how to be your church here in Port Coburn. Lord, in your mercy. Gracious God, we pray for the sick, the lonely, and the hurting in our community and all who care for them. We remember today John Butt, Mary Cullen, Elizabeth Ebert, Marion Empey, Louise Hayton, Robert Krasick, Nancy Lisk, Dominic, Julia, Donna, Megan, Anthony, Tammy, and Derek. Help them to keep their eyes fixed on you and give them the courage to face the trials and temptations that may come. Bring healing and comfort for all people around the world suffering from the short and long-term effects of COVID-19. Spread, speed their recovery and slow the spread of this virus. We thank you for the efforts of all those involved in treating, testing, and caring for patients and ask for your protection over them as they go about their daily work. Lord, in your mercy. Loving God, we pray for those who have died those whom we have loved and see no more. We ask for your comfort for all who mourn. Lord, in your mercy. Yeah. Almighty God, we ask you to be with us in all that we do throughout the coming week, that we may serve you by serving other people. Accept these prayers for the sake of your Son, our risen Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Dear friends in Christ, God is steadfast in love and infinite in mercy. 
He welcomes sinners and invites them to his table. Let us confess our sins confident in God's forgiveness. Most merciful God, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed, by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole hearts. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. May Almighty God have mercy upon you, pardon and deliver you from all your sins, confirm and strengthen you in all goodness, and keep you in eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Please stand. May the peace of the Lord be always with you. Let's share each other a sign of peace. Peace at home.
that he might shatter the chains of evil and death and banish the darkness of sin and despair. By his resurrection, he brings us into the light of your presence. Now with all creation, we raise our voices to proclaim the glory of your name. Holy, 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 holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed be you, come of the name of your Son, our Lord Jesus Christ. Hosanna in the highest. Please be seated. 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 Holy and gracious God, accept our praise through your Son, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who on the night he was handed over to suffering and death, he took bread, gave you thanks, saying, Take, eat, this is my body, which is broken for you. In the same way, he took the cup, saying, This is my blood, which is shed for you. When you do this, do it in memory of me. Remembering, therefore, his death and resurrection, we offer you this bread and this cup, giving thanks that you have made us worthy to stand in your presence and serve you. We ask you send your Holy Spirit upon the offering of your Holy Church. Gather into one all who share in these sacred mysteries, filling them with the Holy Spirit, confirming their faith in the truth that together we may praise you and give you glory through your servant, Jesus Christ. All glory and honor are yours, Father, Son, with the Holy Spirit, in the Holy Church, now and forever. Amen. And now, as our Savior Christ has taught us, we are bold to sing.
May we who have been inwardly nourished be ready to follow you all our days. We ask this in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. Glory to God, whose power working in us can do infinitely more than we can ask or imagine. Glory to God from generation to generation. In the church, the name of Christ Jesus, forever and ever. May the strength of God sustain you. May the power of God preserve you. And may the hands of God protect you. And may the way of God direct you. And may the blessing of God go with you, this day and forever. Amen. Please be seated for a few announcements. Okay, um, so if you haven't heard, uh, you don't have to register to come anymore. Just come. Yay. Um, we still obviously have to do the masks and we have to take name and numbers, but you don't have to call to let us know you're coming. Just show. We just want to see you. So everybody come. Uh, this afternoon at 4 o'clock is our praise and worship service. Uh, if you want to come, you're more than welcome. Music's a little different. You get to dance around a little differently, so... It'd be a lot of fun. Uh, Tuesday at 10.30 is prayer shawl ministry. We meet here in the church. Everybody's welcome. You do not have to be a master knitter or crocheter to be a part of this because, believe me, it took me four months to finish one shawl. So, yeah. Like, yeah. Um, peace, uh, the peace prayers are this Wednesday across the street at 12.15. Uh, I hope everybody will come. Uh, you would have seen, hopefully you saw this in the email or you saw this on Facebook, and if you, if you don't have either of those, you're hearing about it for the first time. Um, historically, uh, the bishops have had something called the Bishop's Company Dinner. And it would have been this grand event that I would have invited you to, and hopefully a group of us would have gone into Hamilton for an absolutely fantastic dinner and had, a, you know, a multitude of guest speakers that, and it was, it's always been great, it's always been fun. And the one thing I like about Bishop Susan, the one of the little things that she's added to her Bishop Company dinner is that there's a table just of candy for you to go and just help yourself with, it's lovely. Um, but because of COVID, unfortunately, we can't have the dinner. Um, so what she's hosting now is called the Bishop's Event. It's on November 15th at 7 p.m. It is a conversation via Zoom. I know, we're all tired of Zoom, but it, I'm still going to encourage you to uh, possibly watch it. Um, it is with Bishop Susan and the Most Reverend Right Honorable Stephen Cottrell. He is the Archbishop of York and the Primate of England. Um, I had the honor and privilege of uh, meeting him uh, two, three years ago at our clergy conference before he was the primate, before he was the archbishop. Um, this man is just amazing. He is funny. He uh, truly, he is an incredibly holy man. Um, and I'm just so looking forward to the conversation that I know Bishop Susan and him would be having. So if you're interested, um, please go on the diocesan website. Uh, there will be a link for you to go. There is a charge. It's $25. But um, I, I strongly encourage you. It will be a great experience. Um, our next town hall meeting for our mission action plan is Sunday uh, the 14th at 12 noon over in the Guild Hall. This I do need you to register for because I need numbers. I need to know how many are, people are coming just so I can plan. That's just me and my little idiosyncrasies. Um, so I would appreciate that. Um, if you've already come, you don't need to come again. Um, but the mission action plan, as I've said before, it's not about my desire for this church, it's about your desire for this community. And so I really want to give you this opportunity to come and have a voice and sit and chat. So um, if you could please call the office and let us know if you could join us um, on Sunday the 14th. Last but not least, at the back of the church you are going to see a very large glass um, jar. It's, it's, it's a wine jar, I'm not going to lie. Um, my neighbor across the street makes wine, and he was cleaning house, and he got rid of it. 
And my husband, in his infinite wisdom, goes, Jody can do something with that, and took it. <laughs> The basket that the jar uh, was in is now in the narthex and is holding all our prayer shawls. The jar, um, I decided, would just simply be a, a giant change jar. So if you are one of those people who collects change but absolutely hates rolling it and don't know what to do with it, just come put it in this jar because I have no issues with rolling change. Uh, once when I was at Grace and I was the youth minister in Waterdown, I, I, we did this kind of little fundraiser and I got $200 in pennies. Yes, $200 in pennies I rolled. It was, you know what, it was fun. It was lovely. Um, the money for that jar basically is going to, it's one of the many things, ways that we're going to try and raise money for outreach. Um, if you noticed on the front of our church there is a giant hole. Um, Mr. Kennedy was nice enough to put that hole there for us. Um, but it is for uh, something that Bob Arthur has been building us, which is a blessing box. A blessing box, in case you don't know. If, have you seen around Port Colborne people who have those little libraries on their front lawn? You know, you can borrow books. Blessing box is kind of the same idea, but instead of having books, it has canned goods or hats or mitts or toothpaste or toothbrushes or you know, feminine hygiene products. It has things for people in the community that they can't necessarily afford. It's a blessing box. So the money from that jar could potentially go to stock that. Um, the money from that jar could potentially go to food for friends, um, whatever. But that's what that jar is going to be for. Um, I figure maybe every three, four months, I'll empty it out, roll it, and let you guys know what was in there and where it's going. So if you happen to have any extra change, um, I invite you to um, put it in that jar. So if you could please stand for our closing hymn, Be Thou My Vision. <laughs> 